Good morning from a rainy summer day in Alexandria. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We've been around for 20 years. I've been around in missile defense for 40. Um, we have our 52nd uh, roundtable, congressional roundtable, presented to you uh, today with the um, missile defense north of the Arctic in the formidable Shield 23 exercise. Um, it is a very relevant exercise in a very relevant world. Uh, the Arctic is tremendous in its potential for a lot of reasons, both uh, for transportation, for the minerals underneath, for strategic positioning over the globe, and certainly um, what's going on in Europe uh, with Russia and how this capability that we have in a naval format that is probably the most advanced in the world if you look at 360 degree missile defense from space all the way down to sea. The uh, U.S. Navy and its Aegis ballistic missile ships are the best platform right now in the world operational to do that mission. Uh, formidable Shield has been uh, uh, started off as a as a exercise by MDA way back in 2015 to start to look at uh, moving information uh, sensing sp specifically and working with different maritime uh, sh ships and nations from NATO from other than NATO and the United States. It's graduated into the Sixth Fleet the very <laughs> next on I think 2017. And it has been a six fleet um, MDA combination. And this year, it goes every two years. And, and this year, it, it's been a complete, basically, six fleet uh, positioning on that. And it's the first time the exercise has involved land, air, and uh, sea, all elements together, all elements uh, integrated and combined with multiple countries engaged, which, which include France and Netherlands and Spain um, and others that, that, that were with us in, in this aspect of it. And it's for the most part, not the most part, for the real part, it is using real capabilities that we have today and very exciting of it playing into the HIMAR position, which is a very important element of any of our deterrence and any of our missile defense capabilities or offensive strike capabilities uh, around the world. So this this is an exercise we're really excited to explain it to you and we have the we have the commander of the exercise to do that in the best way. So I think we're, we're, we're looking forward to a great discussion. Uh, Captain John Lips is, is an expert on this defense, uh, especially uh, Navy Aegis BMD. He is on the infamous ship, the Lake Erie, which is our probably our greatest test ship in the history of our Navy for missile defense with the SM-3. So he spent a lot of time on that, as well as previous ships. He also was in charge of the Romania uh, Aegis Shore site there in, in, in Europe and understands that. He's been involved in the testing of the SM-3 Block 2, 2A and the, and the 1B. Um, and he has been put in charge of this exercise. He was a deputy commander. He is the current commander of the Task Force 64 Nav Ur, NAVS, uh, NAVAS uh, capability uh, that's done it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Captain John Lips. John, good to see you. I saw you in Germany last the last year for an Army Europe change of command. It was great to have your naval presence there, sir. Thank you, Ricky, and good mo good morning, or out here in Naples, Italy, uh, good evening from a, a balmy, sunny uh, southern Italy. Uh, so it's, it's 85 degrees and the sun's shining. So we know we're, we're getting towards uh, uh, August and then the later part of the summer. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Formidable Shield um, is really, I'm, I'm biased, I, admittedly, I will uh, say that up front, uh, having had uh, the distinct privilege um, to put to sea uh, in this last iteration as the commander of a task force that uh, was composed of 17 ships, over 30 aircraft 
um, F-35s, F-15s, E-2s, helicopters, um, a U.S. nuclear-powered submarine, and then eight ground units that spanned capabilities across the alliance. My international uh, staff uh, that supported me um, was uh, uh, provided by eight different countries from the alliance. There were 23 officers uh, that came today, uh, came together um, the week that our flagship sailed from Ferrol, Spain. And so, you know, I ask you to, to keep that in context and the audience to keep that in context as we start to talk about some of the complexity and the notable firsts, quite frankly, uh, that those um, sailors, airmen, uh, soldiers, and Marines pulled together demonstrating SACIR's commitment for deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic Alliance. Um, you know, it was an incredible um, telling story of the power of the people uh, that the Alliance is able to bring together with this high-end capabilities. And, it, and what is required to be able to successfully integrate and employ, you know, the joint sensors and effectors across a force in order to be able to uh, demonstrate a credible uh, defense in a modern threat environment. You know, I think we were very successful uh, in demonstrating the integration and lethality of the alliance across all domains in both the Arctic Circle and the North Atlantic. And so that's another piece that we will talk about. Um, you know, formidable shield and execution was happening across over a thousand miles of battle space. Simultaneously, kinetic uh, events and engagements were occurring on both the Endoya Space Defense Range in Norway and the Hebrides um, range off of Scotland. Uh, and so successfully exercising command and control over two surface action groups at sea from my flagship um, and then bringing them all together uh, was a, a powerful testament to the staff, quite frankly, in their efforts. You know, I referenced we were embarked in Blas de Letho. Um, that's uh, the Aegis F-103 uh, Spanish frigate uh, that's home ported in parole. Uh, it was a privilege to be able to break my pennant uh, and in her at the very end now of my career. You know, as a as a backdrop, I think it's uh, it's 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 a wonderful bookmark. Quite frankly, two months after I took command um, in March of 2021, I took command at CTF 64, and in May of 2021, I executed Formidable Shield 21. In May of 23, I executed Formidable Shield. And in August of 23, I will retire. Um, and so I've got two months separation on both ends of, of those bookmarks, those, those rudder stops, as it were, in, in naval uh, parlance. Uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, an amazing testament um, to, to the team that pulled this together. You know, some of those notable firsts that I, I referenced, um, we'll talk. Uh, I think one of the neat things that Formidable Shield brings to the table is uh, 23 was the first time we had involvement with both Joint Forces Command Brunson and Joint Forces Command Norfolk. We integrated with MARCOM uh, as, as a task group commander under Strike 4 NATO. I had the opportunity to integrate with MARCOM assets at sea. And so that's almost the equivalent in, in the U.S. Navy of bringing the integration across two different fleets together. Um, Strike 4 NATO is responsible to SAC your uh, for the exercise of command and control over U.S. carrier forces, U.S. expeditionary forces, U.S. ballistic missile defense forces in the NATO fight. Um, and so bringing MARCOM and Strike Force NATO together, um, we were able to do successfully uh, in the execution of an anti-submarine warfare prosecution, uh, and I was able to provide some of my uh, underway replenishment resources in exchange uh, with uh, the SNAGM or Standing Naval Maritime Group Commander's forces in the North Sea uh, as he was transiting up into the Baltic. So that was a, a unique first. Um, we integrated with the, the U.S. Marine Corps uh, and Second Law uh, Marine Air Wing uh, that had deployed a tactical air operations center to Andoya. And where the integration occurred there was a sharing of battle space. Uh, and so that my task group forces at sea integrated with the land-based forces and sensors and effectors, 
both offensive and defensive that the Marines were able to bring to Formidable Shield allowed for the successful um, joint engagement zone live firings from a ship and from a land-based NASAMS battery on Andoya. Now, the piece that is also, I think, integral there is that we were exchanging, um, before those engagements were occurring, Ricky, we had uh, deployed a U.S. Marine Corps recon, counter-recon sensing force uh, from the USS Oscar Austin that had gone ashore uh, a few days before, were able to identify a surface track uh, that was a target, put that out over the Link 16 network that the uh, task group was um, operating under the umbrella of. Uh, we were able to share that track with the forces that were also down operating off the Hebrides. So they were say, seeing our surface and air picture as we were seeing their surface and air picture uh, across a satellite network architecture that allowed that. But that surface track subsequently was the origin of some air launch targets uh, that went to sea, came back around, were identified as hostile by my air warfare commander, passed over. Uh, one was engaged by the Dutch ship Tromp. Uh, she was the force air uh, for that surface action group. That track was subsequently passed over also to the TAOC, that tactical air operations center I mentioned, who then uh, relayed the track to the NASAMS battery, uh, the, that was ashore, uh, the Norwegian Army on one serial and the Norwegian Air Force NASAMS battery on a second serial that provided engagements. While that was happening, I was able to have my surface warfare commander, the USS Oscar Austin, declare that target um, that the Marine Corps had identified as hostile, which allowed the Marines that had been deployed with HIMARS batteries ashore to subsequently engage. So there was there was a lot of integration that was enabled by, you know, that local network that was then displayed um, by a satellite from the Arctic Circle all the way down to headquarters here in Naples at the, the Sixth Fleet and Navier headquarters, and then my strike for NATO headquarters in Lisbon, and was relayed from that TAOC and the CRC that was on the shore in support of the AIRCOM commander in Ramstein. And so... You know, those commanders had visibility over the battle space off the Hebrides and the battle space off the Andoya and those fights that were executing all at the same time. You know, you had referenced we employed F-35s uh, for the first time in uh, Formidable Shield. Both the U.S. and the Norwegians uh, brought F-35s uh, to the serials, uh, these live fire rehearsals. And so we were able to use them uh, in engagements. Uh, where they simulated engagements from the Norwegians and they were able to um, provide SA and early warning of inbound threats. Um, I referenced the USS San Juan, uh, the submarine uh, that we were actively pursuing, um, prosecuting. Uh, my anti-submarine warfare commander was the French uh, Frem Frigate Bretagne. Uh, she subsequently uh, engaged as a ASW frigate uh, Britain not only was very successful in integrating those uh, aforementioned MARCOM forces uh, that we shared, uh, but then she subsequently engaged a Mach 3 um, cruise missile uh, that was 10 or 10 meters uh, off the deck, so it was coming by. And so that was a, a demonstration of my anti-submarine warfare commander and frigate you know, conducting a Mach 3 engagement with a uh, Aster missile. Um, we mentioned, uh, you know, the live fire in a joint engagement zone. Um, I don't think I had previously shared. Uh, one of the other notable firsts was this was the first time we not only had air-to-air -air engagements, um, but a UK um, uh, Eurofighter uh, was launched, was conducting an engagement off of a track that was being provided by uh, the UK HMS Defender, their air warfare destroyer, their Type 45. Um, that was, again, though, in concert with them informing me as the uh, task group commander of that battle as it was happening. And so on my Spanish flagship, a thousand miles away, I was watching the UK local air defense commander in conduct or in concert with UK air forces conducting um, barrier air patrols 
engaging um, with uh, their Meteor AMRAAM missile, their uh, advanced uh, medium range air to air missile, a, a surface track over water. Um, additionally, uh, we this was the first time that uh, both fighters and uh, E-2 Charlie from the French while conducting flight operations, were tracking a ballistic missile that was launched from the Hebrides, and that track was shared across the forces um, towards the conclusion of the exercise. Um, I failed to mention that you know one of the other notable firsts was uh, some logistics uh, moves. When you when you think of a force the size um, that we were employing across the battle space that we uh, conducted our operations to set those conditions. Um, you know, my, my tagline for logistics was, if you didn't bring it there, you weren't going to find it there. Um, and uh, what we were able to do was demonstrate the successful expeditionary loading of a Harpoon anti-ship cruise missile on a U.S. P-8 up in Norway that successfully then launched, integrated with my uh, Spanish flagship and the uh, Danish, one of the Danish ships. Uh, that was operating in concert for a simultaneous time on top engagement of a target up above 73 degrees north latitude in the Arctic Circle. Um, and so that was a, a successful, uh, you know, uh, evolution uh, to conduct both the, the, the ordnance handling and loading. But that was day one of the exercise, Ricky. I remind you, this staff that was coordinating this across the air and sea domains um, and the logistics front uh, had just come together you know, 10 days before when we had all met in parole and then got underway um, to, to head up to the Arctic Circle. Um, so, so at the end of the, you know, at the end of the, the summary from a formidable shield, it, I think it's the unprecedented demonstration of cutting edge capability and capacity uh, that reflects the high end um, capabilities that the Alliance is able to bring to bear in you know the demonstration of deterrence and defense, but it it is absolutely predicated on um, the network architectures that enable the battle space that allow us to do that across the joint force. You know, it's um, to be able to uh, integrate the sensors, the effectors, to augment the battle space that you need um, because of Mach three targets whether they are cruise missiles or anti-ship ballistic missiles, or they are anti-ship cruise missiles being used to strike land targets, as we see in the Ukraine, or they are ballistic missiles that have been modified to strike ships at sea. Um, we have to be able to uh, employ all of the sensors and all of the effectors. The only way that we can do that is to be able to ubiquitously share fire control quality data across the entire joint force. Now, I'd like to tell you that we had, um, you know, absolute success in that. And I think uh, Admiral Montgomery would probably call me to task as he rightfully should. Um, you know, having had the, the, the privilege to have been briefing Admiral Montgomery all the way back to when he was Commander Montgomery and then Commodore Montgomery. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's great to see you, sir, but I'll be honest, um, it was not seamless uh, in the architecture management. It was a challenge. It's hard. Um, we're not where we need to be, uh, to be blunt. Um, we're making progress. Uh, and, you know, Formidable Shield gave us a great opportunity to bring this uh, equipment, this kit across the Alliance force together. And we learned a lot. Um, not only did we learn about the architectures, uh, you know, but having spent a lot of my time operating uh, out in the Indo-Pacific, you know, weather in the Arctic Circle uh, is your adversary. Thank, thank you, John. And let's let's go for the for the bigger public perception and understanding the education of why North of the Arctic is important strategically for the warfighter and those challenges in communication because you don't have the satellite coverage up there that you would there's weather conditions so now you are challenged with being able to move comms and now you have to go with intent and now you're dealing with foreign or not 
our allies and partners that maybe don't have the same intent we do. How, just Can you just give a broad brush to the public on, on that set of why it's important up there and what are those specific challenges that's unique than, than Biden anywhere else in the world? So, you know, I think it's certainly in the European context, if you take a step back and you look at the European continent, uh, it's a peninsula. Uh, and, you know, most people, to a certain extent, don't look through that lens. But if you look at it at the European continent as a naval officer, it's a peninsula bounded by the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic, and the High North. Uh, and so by not operating up there and generating the, the repetitions and the sets that we need to be comfortable to recognize the limitations of operating, we are unilaterally removing battle space. Um, and I think that that is uh, not where you want us to be as a force. Um, and the preponderance of capability that can be brought to bear from a persistence and a sustainability perspective is maritime forces there. Um, you know, it is maritime forces augmented by land or air forces, uh, but principally it's going to be maritime forces that are able to generate the conditions and effects to support operations and freedom of maneuver and maximizing the front that we need in the theater. It's those maritime forces, quite frankly, that are going to be able to provide for the sea lines of communication that presuming, um, you know, a land war is an element um, of the conflict associated with a major peer competitor and the European front. Uh, the sustaining of those forces are absolutely uh, vital and integral on the capabilities of the maritime force operations. And so, you know, I, just at, the, at, at a, a quick snapshot, I would say that's why it's strategic. Now, the implications with, you know, kind of going back to my Indo-Pacific days, one of the things that was very telling operating at 73 degrees north latitude, um, the satellite look angles that you referenced are absolutely you know, dependent upon where um, the operations of those normally geosynchronous satellites are uh, over the alliance capabilities that are brought to bear. And so you go from satellite look angles that are measured in 20s of degrees of elevation and higher uh, to satellite look angles that are measured in singles degrees of elevation and all of the challenges that that can bring uh, when you need maximum bandwidth associated with a modern architecture. Um, the other thing, just very bluntly, the water temperature survivability in operations up there. Um, you know, water temperature is measured or survivability uh, in May in the Arctic Circle, where we were low Arctic Circle, was measured in tens of minutes um, compared to days in the you know, Indo-Pacific regions. And so uh, how can you respond uh, from a survivability perspective? Are you ready to do that? We, in May, were, you know, operating my force in snowstorms out at sea uh, when we were conducting those harpoon launches. Um, so yeah, that's uh, just a quick snapshot of there. There's also an aspect um, that as you operate in the higher latitudes, you know, um, I grew up thinking weather in the context of ducks for my radar and how the meteorological conditions affect the range or the skip zones of my com of my communications um, and you know that that can alter the ranges well we have to think about the fact that the solar weather has a more pronounced impact and an implication to operations on uh, both sensors and communications when you're conducting um, ops in the high north and those are things that just as I was being briefed on water temperature and, and legacy atmospheric weather, I was also being briefed on saddle, or on uh, space weather and the solar uh, weather that was occurring. Um, and so that was kind of, a, I think, a, a reflection of the new battle space as we, we conduct this, these types of operations. And then the final piece, the other, the, the last notable first um, that I would you know, share with you is, is the task group commander. Um, was on one of the days uh, towards the end of the exercise, you know, you're, you're executing a norm, normal battle rhythm. Um, administratively, you're taking briefs. You know, I mentioned the, the, the weather briefs, there's intelligence briefs, operations briefs, what ships are, you know, had a maintenance problem overnight, or what are my assignments uh, for helicopters available, things like that. 
Uh, that particular day started at about a, a 6 a.m. I got a phone call, um, and uh, we were a couple hundred miles uh, off the coast of Scotland. Uh, that um, one of the ships we needed to conduct a medevac. Um, we were prepared for that, uh, as you would expect. We had, you know, uh, designated um, uh, helicopter to be able to support my my sea to shore movement uh, in a case like that. Um, one of the one of the uh, oilers, actually the Spanish um, oiler Patina, uh, is equipped with a I think it was a twelve bed hospital on board, uh, and she you know she she goes to sea not only bringing my fuel for the force. Uh, but uh, she carried 11 Marines and had a hospital, a dentist, a doctor, and four ICU beds. So we, we had all kinds of options to be able to, to execute if necessary. Um, but in this case, uh, we needed to get uh, a sailor ashore. Um, we had uh, indications that uh, it was probably surgery was going to be necessarily involved. Um, so that's how my morning started, was planning that medevac. Uh, you know, ensuring that we had lily pads uh, for the helicopter to pick up a sailor, fly to another country ship, land on it, um, and then fly ultimately uh, to the hospital in Glasgow uh, and get this sailor uh, the medical treatment he needed. Um, upon the conclusion of that operation, we rolled immediately into a refueling of the task force. Um, and so we did that for about two, four hours, I think, as I had multiple ships that were taking on fuel. I went from that right into the flagship, conducted um, a missile shot. Uh, she successfully engaged a, a uh, uh, anti-ship cruise missile threat with her uh, organic ESSM. And 20 minutes after the conclusion of that, Ricky, I was on a VTC from the bridge briefing SAC year. And so that was kind of a notable first yeah. um, of, of, you know, well, my, my perspective. Thank you. I'm going I'm to ask one more question before I get Mark on there. Let, you are more than familiar, you're an expert on EPA. You're an expert on European uh, SM6, SM3, excuse me, SM Block 2A, 1B capabilities on those sites that we put on there. We, as a European continent, are struggling with open architecture on land, on air, to be able to have an integrated fight. We are separating EPAA from cruise missile defense in Europe in, in, in ways where you are not. You are out there with multiple nations. You have open architecture. You do. Why are we not able <laughs> to do that on land, starting with these shore sites? If we, if we had to, if we had to take on Russia and we had to deter Russia with everyone, the lessons learned and what you're doing there in your exercise. And I'm very curious on your overhead persistent 24, uh, 360 cruise missile defense sensor capability, whether that's E2s or how you do that to get 10 foot off the ground, because we're struggling with that everywhere on that aspect. So I'm asking you directly the lessons learned that can be applicable to the European situation that involves US Navy with both those four ships, Egypt, Shoreside, Romania, and uh, Poland, with, with with this formidable shield exercise, and why weren't they involved with it, et cetera. But go ahead. That's it. That, I hope we're a short answer, because I know Mark's got this, but I wanted to make sure I hit that with you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, some of it is policy. Some of it is programmatics. Um, you know, and um, the, the fact is that um, it is, as you, as you um, reference, it is absolutely necessary um, to ensure survivability in a modern day fight. Um, you know, the fact is, you know, as I had articulated uh, earlier, uh, we did have some network challenges and we were not able to fully integrate um, all of the capabilities. I do not have a um, full CEC Link 22 environment across that force where I could exploit um, the, the full capabilities of all of the advanced combat systems that are brought to bear. So the impact of that is I'm going into, you know, a gunfight um, with a couple of daggers, quite frankly. Um, and it's a, it's a challenge because the adversary is not concerned about my limitations. He's going to exploit them. You know, one of the, one of the reflections that I have is the architectures that we are burdened with fighting with right now 
ultimately, um, if we do not uh, expand them to a complete open architecture framework that allows us to seamlessly share fire control quality tracks across not only nations, but domains internal to those nations, we're going to relearn the lessons that our land brethren learned following World War I, where they were attempting to employ cavalry uh, and musket tactics in an artillery and machine gun fight. We're going to learn that in the modern day IAMD fight because those anti-ship ballistic missiles, those high-end um, anti-ship cruise missiles, the um, hypersonic missiles that are available uh, for proliferation yeah, yeah. Um, will be a threat. Um, and they're being flown and fired by peer adversaries almost on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, are we there yet? No, sir, we are not there. Part of it is, uh, I, part of it is policy prescriptions. Um, part of it is uh, rivalries. And, and part of it is, you know, quite frankly, how weapon systems are designed uh, and, you know, from a programmatics perspective. Okay. All right. I will now pass it over to Mark. Mark was a J-5 at UConn. Mark was your, as you mentioned, Commodore, Commander, uh, an expert uh, on the European theater, an expert in the Navy, uh, and a member of our board of directors. Mark Montgomery. Mark, it's all yours. Well, Ricky, thank you very much. And um it's great to listen to Jonathan, uh, um, Jonathan Lips there for a bit. You know, he's a, uh, um, you know, formidable shield was a formidable exercise. And Admiral Morley, uh, Admiral Morley and uh, John Lips were great leaders on this. And when I think of uh, John, I think he's he is a, a, a BMD force of nature. And I think that uh, his retirement in August is going to be very impactful for us. Um, as a force, uh, it, it almost a, it, in a Star Wars uh, um, method, it'd be like there'll be a disturbance in the force when he retires. And so I hope the, the Navy's in a position to pick up on it. All right. Um, look, this exercise, first of all, um, you know, I don't, I, I love Mike Gilday, the CNO in the Navy. Why he's saying we need a rim pack in the Arctic when you're actually running a rim pack in the Arctic is beyond me, except this isn't rim pack, is rim pack is the lowest common denominator exercise. This was literally a highest common denominator exercise. Um, and look, um, you know, should not like watch this exercise and go, well, that's it, air defense in the handled list, right? What we've really done here is show the very best of NATO. The very best of NATO in missile defense is cruise missile defense at sea. For, for, uh, we, in cruise missile defense, we have capacity, we have capabilities and capacity on multiple, multiple hundreds of NATO ships. I mean, 81 cruisers and destroyers just from the Navy, you know, or, uh, you know, even more than that from our Navy, 90, just from our Navy, we have capable cruise missile defense uh, in high capacity. Um, and our allies and partners introduced another 40, 50 ships worth of cruise missile defense, 30, 40 ships in NATO. Uh, some of our, Jap our uh, Asian allies, uh, Japan and Korea and Australia do as well, but, you know, just for the purpose of this, so we do have it. And look, we get to choose the battle space, you know, where geographically, where we're fighting by where our high end naval assets are. And therefore, our capacity is more than enough. Now, when you move to at sea, at sea ballistic missile defense, the numbers go down. A lot. Your capability is still there, but your capacity starts to go down and it becomes exceptionally U.S. centric. You know, 80 percent plus of the forces that could be brought to bear probably be U.S. Navy in that ballistic missile defense at sea. Not 100%, but about 80%, so it's a lot. Um, and again, though, you get to pick where you put your high value assets, so you're in a little bit better position. <clears throat> when you move this problem ashore, even though you bring some of the same countries with good capabilities, the capacity becomes a real problem in both cruise missile defense and ballistic missile defense because your adversary gets to pick the geography where he attacks, the targets. Does he go counter value or counter target? Does he hit your systems or your people? your military infrastructure, your civilian infrastructure, after a while it just becomes, you need to defend everything from anything. And we don't have that capability and cap we don't have the capacity for sure. And in a few areas, this is where the US has let it down. We don't have, and you and I have discussed this a million times, Ricky, uh, cruise missile defense, ground-based cruise missile defense cap capacity and the thickness that we have it in the, uh, in the maritime domain from the Navy. 
And there's a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, and very, I'm not, you know, throwing knives at the army. There's good reasons why they can't do it. But the bottom line is the systems they've been depending on, as I say, are the Phoenix Suns of missile defense systems, two years away from being two years away. Um, if pick, I think, is about, you know, they just announced, I believe, a two year delay. Three. Just to make, to make my point for me, because you know, it was getting a little stale. They said, nope, here you go, Montgomery, <laughs> another two year delay. Um, and look, now we're really dependent on our partners. And it turns out our partners aren't thick, right? They don't bring, you know, thick capacity. They bring one battalion or one battery. You know, they don't bring the U.S., you know, the way we come in hard with Thad or Patriot, you know, with thickness in addition to, um, to, uh, to uh, capabilities. You know, in other words, capacity in addition to capabilities. Now, look, in ballistic missile defense, we're also, you know, we have a, you know, we have capability and capacity. It's a little bit higher U.S. percentages now because of Thad and and Patriot and its SRBM role, uh, but still not near enough. And then we insanely don't use the um, European phase adaptive approach radar systems, the Aegis Ashore systems, and Romania and Poland are uh, are distinctly set aside just for that Iranian threat, you know, that might come in some distant future, as opposed to the Russian threat, which is literally happening on our on our doorstep. That, that's an issue that that uh, um, NATO needs to tackle. They need to tackle it. Uh, they should tackle it in Vilnius. They'll probably pass and try to tackle it in, in later on uh, conferences and meetings, which means it won't be resolved for years with an S on the end. You know, so real issue. So from my point of view, formidable shield, an excellent exercise that absolutely demonstrates the um, <clears throat> the uh, the maritime capabilities and capacity and cruise missile and ballistic missile defense. A few things I'd want to uh, uh, anchor on here. Look, um, the U.S. Navy and U.S. and to a lesser degree the U.S. Air Force kind of traffic in the idea of firing quality track data. In other words, passing firing quality track data between systems. The Navy's been able to do this for about 35 years with a system called Cooperative Engagement Capability. Lips has mentioned it, but truthfully, um, you know, it was JADC2 before we thought up the the funky name JADC2. Um, but the Air Force 35 years ago didn't want to play in it, probably very good reasons. But the bottom line is 35 years later, they've had an epiphany that having all sensors and all shooters talking to each other at, at a foreign quality track level is really good. So, you know, for about a trillion dollars, I mean, I'm joking there, maybe a hundred billion dollars, we're going to make a modern version of CEC and give it to everybody eventually. In the meantime, we need to be using CEC and other foreign quality track data systems. So, for example, the Air Force should be putting this show, demonstrates to us the the need for putting CEC on the new E7 wedge tail, similar, you know, the new the, the AWACS replacement, similar to what we have on the E2C and E2D Hawkeye and advanced Hawkeye aircraft that the United States Navy and many of our allies fly. Uh, the Japanese have finally, um, the Japanese Air Force has finally overcome the objection of the U.S. Air Force and put CEC on their most recent uh, purchases here. And just because I've thrown shade at the Na at the Army and the Air Force, I throw some shade at the Navy. The Navy needs to get hot on Link 22. You know, and, and doing research for this, you know, the Navy's first order of Link 22 was in 2012. Their first installation will probably be in 2026. This is Army-like in its installation speed, right? I mean, we need to get this moved out to the ship so that we can be passing Fire quality track data around the NATO network as well. We agreed to this. I'm pretty sure Spay War designed the system like 20, 15 years ago, or actually starting in the 1990s, going all the way back there. So we literally owned it, but have disowned it, and we need to get take ownership again and buy it and get it on and get it on the ships. I think we're ready for it. I think most of our systems are Link 22 compatible. It's just an issue of pushing now and getting there. So little shade on all three services. There's things we need to do there. Uh, but I would say the biggest one is this land-based uh, cruise missile and ballistic missile defense systems getting in capacity. What Formidable Shield shows you is that your forces can operate when they have sufficient capability and capacity in the integrated air missile defense throughout the spectrum. And so we absolutely need to take what we're learning in the maritime and apply it in the ground in the in the in the ground uh, terrain areas, so that our our army and air force can move with the same agility, security, and safety that Lips's uh, task force was able to do, and and then finally, integrating the offensive defense. Glad to see that that's another thing Jazzy Two will bring us that wasn't inherent in CEC. 
um, and but is inherent in NIFCA and other things that the Navy was pushing you know, 20 years ago, but couldn't get joined. You know, we need to, uh, you know, pull that together so that we're integrated offense and defense, because sometimes the best defense is thinning the herd at launch, right? You know, and so while it's hard to find the launcher that is scooting around in the forest somewhere, it's not hard to find the launcher two to three seconds after it launches its weapon. There's a glaring spot on some kind of DSP satellite saying, hey, it's right there, right? And then, uh, you know, it, it, it gives you the, the that long you need for a quick counter strike. But you got to be quick. You got to be integrated. And LIPS has shown that in this exercise. So, so we need we need to work on that. And then, and then um, you know, finally, uh, Ricky, what I'd say is that this is something NATO needs to really get focused on. You know, it has its own roles and responsibilities issue coming here. Uh, the and and, then, and they need to get, you know, they're going to need to work through a lot of French, you know, stubbornness and obfuscation, and you know, desire to sell French products uh, throughout NATO. Kind of push through that and say, look. Uh, you know, we just want best of breed. If it if it's an Aster, which I doubt, that's fine. If it's a NASAMS, which isn't American, it's Norwegian, that's fine. If it's a U.S. system, that's fine. If it's an Israeli system that is properly integrated in the link networks, and I, that's an important qualification on it, that's fine too. But we need to get these systems procured and integrated in a fulsome way and then exercised in a ground-based way, similar to what LIPS has shown out, out at sea here. So I, that part really excites me. And I guess if I came back to the U.S. side, it's us getting our roles and responsibilities right, too. You know, a lot can be learned from this in terms of the need. You know, uh, I think, Mar again, maritime are okay. The Navy's in pretty good shape. Uh, but land-based, we have a lot of work to do on, for defense of the homeland. And we have a lot to do for the ground-based defense, the terrestrial-based defense of our four deployed forces. And that's getting some kind of... Uh, long overdue replacement for the Hawk I Hawk systems, you know, 30 years retired now that needs to be replaced out there. Let me say one last thing, you know, we mentioned before, you can never say this enough. <clears throat> we have extremely limited hypersonic defense. And by here, I mean, the traditional hypersonic defense, um, not the sudden like disinformation campaign coming out of DOD that we have some hypersonic capabilities. You know, the hypersonic, I'm talking about hypersonic defense against Maneuvering cruise missiles, you know, in the glide phase, you know, that that are they're out there, able to uh, to maneuver around our our, um, our defenses. We have very limited capability there, a tiny bit, we say publicly with the SM6. But again, you got to thin that herd up in the mid course, and so we're going to have to go get those weapons. You know, we're going to have to de de uh, design, invest in, and get the hypersonic R&D. Now, I'm a little afraid that. You know, we're way behind. We're not pacing the Chinese and Russian investments in offense. I don't know when they're going to deliver. You know, there's conflicting intel coming out now that it's soon or not soon. Look, we need to be investing in the defense because I do know one thing. No matter when they deliver, we need their offensive capability in this true hypersonic cruise missile defense. We need to have an existent and in existence defensive capability ready to deploy to defend our assets and not create a deterrence gap, you know, where they have some, an authoritarian regime has a first strike weapon that can really put us, you know, on our back heels. Um, so we need to get moving on that, on that hypersonic defense. And I just don't think we're there. And I really worry that, you know, as they look at it and they go, well, this might not work. You know, we're way past the zero defect time in this. We should be investing in multiple technologies and, and investing to fail. We should be investing in three or four R&D efforts for hypersonics right now knowing one, two, or three, hopefully not all four, um, you know, don't pay off the way we'd like. And very easily accept that loss, not fire the PEO, not do anything, you know, not tell people, take some risk, because this is one of those places where we need the kind of Manhattan effort, where, where you know, you're, you're, you're throwing everything, uh, you know, at, uh, but the kitchen sink at them, and, and you know what's happening. So for me, really important, let, first, congratulations on, on uh on a formidable shield to, I was about to call it the abominable snowman, but we'll go with formidable shield uh, to John. And also congratulations on a great, uh, ex much longer than the Navy planned a few years ago for him, extensive uh, Navy career with a with a final great command, but also, uh, you know, a good set of lessons learned for us on on the ways forward. Back, back to you, Ricky. All right, Mark. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on Link 22? Um, 
for for the audience because Link 16, I believe, is not firing, sharing firing data. It's it's coordinating all the sensing material to be able to pick out what the target is. And is is Link 22 the answer for open architecture when Formidable Shield mostly had I should say mostly, but the U.S. version with Aegis. And I think Spanish has Aegis. Maybe that was the only one. Hot, whatever that is, can that be applied to land? And from your perspective, what are the best lessons we can take from Formidable Shield to get the policy to apply it to the capabilities that we already have in Europe to leverage that, including those ships, including these and shore sites? Those are the things I'd like to have you comment on, Mark, on that. And you can chip in too, John, after Mark chips in. So be careful, you know, got to be careful about how much, about all the detail here. But what I'll say is, you know, Link, first, I do want to say this. Let's just say for a moment that Link 22 was something we now want to skip generationally. Um, sorry, you can't make an agreement with all your NATO allies 10 years ago. Have them invest in it. I mean, this is, look, alliances are, are great uh, force multipliers. Um, but... You know, sometimes alliances have, you know, small requirements for you. And that's that when you tell everybody else to go get something and say that you're going to get it, you actually got to go get it. Um, so, look, we need to get a Link 22. Do, do I think, look, Link 22 is not CEC exactly, so I want to be careful with that. But I do think it improves the quality, the um, situational awareness that you provide a shooting platform when somebody else senses something putting it down. I don't think it's as good as ages to ages passing. I still think that those kind of launch on remotes are the really the best, right? But they require, you know, proximity and some other things, you know, a, and positioning being in the right spot. Um, and they're unique to that. And it's great that our, you know, beyond Spain, uh, Norway has um, Aegis platforms that aren't always, well, I think they lost one of them in a sinking, but, you know, they've got three left uh, that are uh, very capable. It was okay. I think they could only man three at a time anyway. So it wasn't a complete loss there other than the embarrassment. Um, the uh, But, you know, they have Aegis and there's there's other high quality radar. So what you want to do is where other high quality radars exist, like on British ships, French ships, Italian ships, uh, you want to be able to pass that data at the highest level of, of data quality to enhance your firing solution, particularly when you have a head on shot and that other ship has a crossing view. You know, you're, you're like, um, hummingbird is his like a greyhound bus you know when you're thinking about tracking things so you want to be able to pass that but it's it's just um i think it's one of these things too where it's hard you know we're going to have to keep all of our systems link 22 compatible you know it means extra we're not getting rid of link 16 doing this it's really it's the end of link 11 you know would be the the theory you know it was that's why it was originally designed was kind of move on from link 11 um so i am i'm this is not my number one priority for procurement. I've listed those already, but it's on the list. And and it has a, it gets a, multi, a degree of difficulty factor multiplication because you told your allies to do it and they did it. Um, and therefore you need to get in there too. In fact, I believe the Taiwan's just asked for it and we're getting ready to sell it to them as, a, as well as the Japanese. So, you know, this has an Asia role too. And I'm not sure about the Australians, but I, I suspect because it's NATO, the Australians are procuring Link 22 as well. So it's just something we ought to be doing. Okay, thanks, Let's, Mark. What about the application on the stuff in Europe to for, formidable shield? Or so, so Rick, uh, let me let me rip rip off real quickly. You know, um, the admiral's uh, observations there, um, because I I do think you know one of the one of the serials um, that we had set the course up. Uh, this was an opportunity in during Formidable Shield where the Norwegian, the U.S., and the Spanish Aegis were all operating together. Um, and we also had the U.K. Type 45. And so you have a diversity of sensors and effectors. Um, you do have different network architectures. But in one of the scenarios, the serials, I'll go back to the, the Mach 3 anti-ship cruise missile uh, launch. So I've got a, a target um, that's flying at the force, three times the speed of sound, and 10 meters or 30 feet off the deck. Um, and uh, the engagement times, I, I won't go into details on, but to be able to share that track information in a RAID scenario, which if the adversary is going to engage the force, 
Most likely, it's not going to be a singular shot that's launched, but it'll be a raid scenario. And I have to be able to maximize the depth of fire um, and the missiles in flight to be able to not only attrit that archer, but defend the force, you know, as, as was referenced earlier. In one of these serials that we had conducted, the force was set up where a Dutch um, ship uh, engaged with SM-2, a telemetry ground. Um, the Spanish ship engaged with um, the uh, uh, her SM-2 telemetry ground. And then the French ASW frigate had splashed it with an Aster warshot. Um, and so, you know, that was... But what we were able to demonstrate, and this goes back to, you know, Admiral, you and I growing up, steaming around with fizz green, uh, you know, from a forced perspective, uh, and, you know, being able to have confidence in, in your doctrine and your weapon systems, um, configurations and compatibility to, to operate in that manner for a significant amount of time. And so any expansion of the battle space that I can provide my ship COs or the land or the air forces, um, you know, enables uh, greater decision making. That was, you know, the other thing that I, that these um, fire control quality um, link paths reinforce, ironically enough, from my perspective, was the paramount importance of mission command to be able to set the environment where my commanding officers, regardless of the flag that was flying off the truck or regardless of if they were operating from a NASAMS battery or from a, a U.S. Uh, Aegis platform, that they had the decision-making battle space required to employ their weapon system to the maximum capability. And that's, the, you know, that's what we get uh, out of having the architecture that maximizes that. Otherwise, um, we're not able to employ our weapon systems to their greatest extent possible. So it's really kind of a, not only is it, um, does the architecture enable, you know, a fire control quality track, but the enablement of that maximizes your battle space across the domains that, you know, we're all fighting in different battles against different threats. And this, this singular air threat brings all those forces together. And so that's a that's a hard nut to crack, quite frankly, but it's the world that we're living in today. You know, and I think to your point, uh, your observation, Admiral, that you know, those threats are there today. It is, it, the defensive capability is not maximized or optimized, I would argue, to the extent that we need, but the adversary's got the capability and he's demonstrating it daily, uh, quite frankly. Um, and so we've got to be able to, to, to employ our systems to their maximum um, limits and authorities to be able to provide that by that battle space, both in geography, but then temporally as well. I'll pass over to you, Mark, on questions and so forth. No, so that's good. The um, yeah, I've got the questions here. We've got about five minutes left, uh, lips, and we got you had but you handled two of the three inbound questions in your discussion. That's great. One got asked, and I, I think. Um, I know the answer, but I, I want you to go ahead and take a whack at it. Did this exercise include the GBIs in Alaska and discuss the implications of Aegis BMD Burks being introduced into Arctic environment? So, no, uh, we did not include uh, the ground-based interceptors uh, in Alaska in our serials. Um, and then the operations of the uh, Arley Burks up in the Arctic, um, you know, we kind of talked about some of the weather impacts earlier and what those considerations are, both from a communications, um, but then also from a radar perspective. You know, one of the things that I would like to, you know, note uh, at all from a Navy, U.S. Navy perspective, uh, both the, the participants, USS Porter and USS Oscar Austin, were late changes, very late changes uh, to the serials. And so due to operational commitments, the ships that were originally planned that had been um, supporting grooms in advance of their assignment for this, uh, you know, exercise were re replaced uh, in one case, literally the week before the commencement of the exercise. And so that was the force that showed up and was launching missiles and employing their weapon system in the environment that we saw. Um, so, but going back to the Arctic piece specifically, 
the impacts as we continue to uh, conduct operations up there. We have to learn how to um, maximize the environmental. Uh, we have to recognize the logistical constraints. And we, and we just, uh, from a configuration and an equipage perspective, you know, uh, if you're going to conduct operations up there, I think you have to understand that not all of the force, um, and this is not U.S., it is not um, any one nation in particular, but are configured from an equipment perspective to conduct um, persistent and sustained operations under those environmental conditions. Easily, simply, not every ship's got dry suits for every crew member on board. You know. Over. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think uh, two thoughts on this. I'm glad there's ungroomed systems coming out because uh, there'll be ungroomed systems when the war starts. And once you're sending 40 ships over to the Pacific or the Atlantic or something, there's not enough grooming teams in the uh, in the uh, Lockheed Martin Raytheon world to do that for you. So that's a good thing. You know, with regard to the ships in the Arctic, um, you know, I think the Navy's been tackling the uh, bow hardening issue, you know, um, you know, and, and putting into new construction in the later uh, in the higher hull numbers, and that's good. But look, <clears throat> just because you have bow hardening, does that mean you willy-nilly race around up there? I was in some very heavy seas in an operation called Northern Wedding in the late 1980s, and you know a lot of ship damage was done um, because we weren't wise about um, you know Arctic is is doubly bad because you can't get outside to like fix things that are hit with the first wave, you know, and remove them. <clears throat> then the second wave comes and you have serious damage. Um, you know, because you don't, as uh, you know, you don't have the right, you know, enough safety clippings and and the dry suits and all that. So I'm a big, uh, you know, a big fan of, of being uh, risk conscious in these Arctic exercises. Uh, on the other hand, we need to practice operating up there. I think the Nome base has finally made it into the NDAA in a way that it'll probably be funded. Senator Sullivan will be happy. And and with us, that's in Alaska, and so the U.S. Navy is going to have to get more used to operating in these waters, at least portions of the year. And if the adversary is going to drag us up there, then we're going to need to follow. Um, and if we choose to operate up there for some kind of offensive strike reasons, then we need to bring the defensive capabilities up with them. So um, I think I think the, the uh, you know Operation Formidable Shield um, has a beyond its maritime cruise and ballistic missile defense implications, had some great Arctic implications for the year. All right, um, you know, we got about two minutes left for wrap, but uh, uh, why don't we go uh, uh, Lips, me, and then you, Ricky, okay, on the way out the door. So Lips, give us a minute. Hey, sir, thanks very much. And again, you know, I think the with the exercise, uh, the what I call a, a live fire mission rehearsal actually demonstrated um, was the ability to successfully integrate and employ uh, the high-end joint capability of the Alliance uh, in, you know, demonstrating deterrence and defense uh, in, you know, battle space of both JFC, Brunson, and Norfolk simultaneously. And so when you think about that, um, every one uh, of you um, that are listening should be uh, very proud of, of the U.S. contribution of capability, um, but just as important, if not more so, quite frankly, are those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are able to employ that capability integrated across the joint force. That was my big takeaway, quite frankly. Over. Thanks, Lips. Uh, you know, first of all, again, uh, for the audience, if you didn't know uh, Captain Lips ahead of time, you, you know that uh, the Navy is losing one of its really uh, uh, giants of, uh, of naval ballistic missile defense um, posture, planning, and now operations in this last tour. But definitely the establishment of the uh, of those Aegis shore sites in Europe was among the hardest jobs we we've, we've assigned to any uh, surface warfare officer, um, and they were ashore. Uh, and uh, so fantastic there. Look, this exercise is important. It demonstrates things we can do. It demonstrates the value of an alliance. It demonstrates that an alliance brings immediate capacity because they are. Yes, we have four destroyers growing to six in Rota, um, and we sometimes have a four deployed moving through theater. But our European allies have in theater, you know, 10 Aegis destroyers are grow, and the number is growing with the Spanish, and and 15 to 20 other very capable cruise missile defense shooters and four or five other ballistic missile defense shooters. So we have capabilities 
that give us capacity. Um, and so in the maritime, we're doing great. But the other part of this lesson is we need an equivalent ground-based capability and capacity. And, um, and if we don't get it, the maritime is of little value, right? Uh, the, the, the Russians are not gonna attack you at your strength. They're gonna attack you at your vulnerability. And we have a gaping vulnerability um, that uh, this exercise has shown is not at sea. So Ricky, I'll pass it over to you for the final yeah, no, I I commend John Lips. What a stellar individual for the missile defense community. I mean, that, your, your run and what you've done has helped the missile defense community. It's helped the world in that Navy aspect of the capabilities that you bring. So those 20, those years that you have spent as an officer, sir, thank you uh, for your service to the nation to make the world a safer place. Formidable Shield is bringing diversity of strength together. It's got to continue to do it. It is the way out and continue to push that open architecture to it enable all the players to play is what you're doing and you're ahead of everybody else in Europe on this and it was so cool to see you work with the offensive high marks I mean to play into that game because oh, we have to play in that game and we have to mix our offense with defense to have the best deterrence to to prevent conflict and to win if we go in there and you're demonstrating that and it's, and it's great that you have the Canberra and the curves to say hey we didn't do it all right we got much more to do, but we are moving down that path. And it was great to hear Mark say, hey, this is not RIMPAC. This is better than RIMPAC for what it does at the high end aspect of it. So congratulations on that, sir. Congratulations on the exercise. And I think we as a world are getting better. And, and being put in that domain that nobody wants to go really in and fight is an awesome ability to say, hey, we can play. And we can play everywhere and we're going to be able to deter you if you're going to try and take us on. So, and when. So, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mark, for coming in. It was great to, to, to focus on the Arctic and with this great exercise. So, thank you, John. All right, ladies and